You're listening to Nurture Your Zest. I'm your host, Ashley King, and I will introduce you to a wealth of interesting, fascinating individuals from all walks of life who will share their stories, how they've overcome challenges, and you will find out their top tips for success. Through this podcast, you can gain tips to grow and change your life and the way you see the world and help you to nurture your zest. Welcome to Nurture Your Zest. I'm Ashley King and I'm delighted to be joined by Elfie Jury today. So Elfie, I'm so happy to have you here because I'm a big fan. Um, so thank you so much for coming into our Flamingo Heights studio. I love it. I've seen lots of your content. I've listened to lots of your podcasts. Um, so I feel like I know it, but to be in here at last, brilliant. Thank Bril- you. Lovely. Thank you so much. So I mean, gosh, wow, where to start with you? Because you are a BBC presenter, which is amazing. But on top of that, you have been a priest. You're an artist, (laughs) a comedian, a children's author, um, a jam sandwich seller. Well, (laughs) you've done your research. (laughs) Um, I mean, what's what? How do you like to um, talk about yourself? Well, it's funny. We're chatting now, Ashley, because I'm I'm coming to a big change. I'm about to leave the BBC Breakfast Show, which, you know, that's been what I've done, a big chunk, a big slice of my life, a big part of my rhythm. I get up really early. I have done for about 14 years now, and it's just very, very regular, and all that's going to change. I'm going to going to jump out of all that now um, and do quite a few other things. So I suppose um, if I want to be billed as something... Um, Maybe a communicator, because I, I communicate through my art. <laughs> I communicate through acting and through performance. And I'll be teaching people how to communicate as a communication coach. So there's lots of changes coming up. I love that because you are leaving the BBC and you are <laughs> swapping that for Fright at Tech first, right? You're going to be performing at the Customs House, yes. is that right? Yeah. Um, well, that that came about... Um, when Ray Spencer, who runs the Customs House, it's a gorgeous theatre, and it's the theatre where I took my children to see Pantomime, and we love that experience every Christmas. It's our annual pilgrimage. So for him to say to me, would you be involved in the Pantomime? I said, well, how? So I went over for a chat, and he asked me to design the set. So I went over to tell him I couldn't do it, because I thought... Imposter syndrome. There's no. I can draw a few little pictures, but I can't draw massive scenery pictures. And he went, "Oh, you can. You just draw them as you normally draw them. They blow them up." I was going, "Yeah, but you got to know the dimensions. You got to know you. I can't do that. I've seen those sets every year, and also when you do that, you design the costumes. Well, I can't design costumes. Anyway, he talked me into it, <laughs> and within about an hour, he convinced me to do it. And he said, "Well, that's it." It's yours if you want. I said, if I took this on, I'd have to leave the BBC. And he said, well, when would you, your contract be finished? And I said, well, October. He said, oh, good. Well, you can be in it. So, and then I said, well, who would I play? Because it's Robin Hood and his Merry Men. He said, well, you play all of the Merry Men. So I'm playing Friar Tuck and the rest of the Merry Men with different accents and wigs and impressions. And it's going to be great fun, but a, a big shock to me system and a lot of work and... I think a lot of fear as well. I mean, wow, what an opportunity for yeah. any actor to have the chance to play all those roles at once, but also lots of costume changes mm. and switching quickly. And But that's something that, from my research about you, I'm so impressed by um, your ability to adapt and change and learn new skills. And there seems to be quite a, a regular trend of you going oh, well, I, I don't know how to do this, but I'm just, you know, um, one particular story that stands out for me is how you became a comedian. So mm. actually doing a speech for a wedding and, and having yeah. to kind of like impress, um, impress a comedian yourself. Yeah. And, you know, it feels like whatever knife throws at you, you rise to the challenge. Well, yes, I think so. I mean, maybe it's because I'm naive or dumb, but I do love the thrill of being uncertain and taking a risk and taking a jump. I think sometimes you've got to be 
uh, careful and you can't just be reckless with it. Um, and I think it was probably easier when I was a bit younger and I was I was single and I was didn't have children. But now I've got to think it a bit more through and make sure things are, are a little bit more settled. But there's always a risk. There's always a, you know, a period of uncertainty if you're self-employed. But I think if you don't do it, it's a bigger risk because if you... If you just wait and look back and think, I wonder what would have happened if I'd done that. That must be a real sense of frustration. So I've roughly every ten or so years taken a big, a bigish jump, um, but I've usually made it a little. There's there's a few safety nets here and there that people don't always see, and I've just tried to make sure that there's enough protection just in case I fall off that tightrope. Well, I think it's very wise to do that. I mean, as entrepreneurs, it can be challenging to manage different gigs and different things we're doing. And also as creatives, mm -hmm. I think there's always that dance between mental health and creativity and looking after ourselves, but also producing excellent work. And often um, people burn out, you know, yeah. and, and that can really impact your creativity and your output as well. So. Um, have you ever had a time where you felt, you know, really creative and then you've lost that spark? I think I've, I've never run out of creativity, but, and, and I, I have sort of felt burnout before, but I think what I've experienced more is spinning too many plates and the quality of the, the jobs are not good enough. And I know they could have been better if I'd given them more focus, maybe spun a couple of fewer plates. And that's what I'm usually in danger of and have to get it just right and maybe have to... It's a great experience saying no sometimes. Um, I'm all for saying yes to the big thing, to the right thing, but I think sometimes you've got to remember when to say no. And the times I've been strong enough or courageous enough to say no it's definitely helped the other stuff, but it's sometimes hard knowing what to say no to. When you're self-employed, you've got to say yes to a lot of stuff just to stay afloat sometimes. Certainly when you're starting out, I would say just say yes to everything. Just get to get on that bike and just to keep moving. And then once you're moving, you can be a bit more selective and then you can be really selective for your own good and for the people around you so you get that balance right. Yeah, you, you're right about saying no and, and that hierarchy of what's important to you mm -hmm. can help. A, a trick I learned recently is to make a matrix of the tasks that you want to do or could do, your should do mm -hmm. list. And um, that if you like to, you can do it, but kind of working out which ones matter to you and then actually scoring them and saying, oh, well, actually, this is the one that I least like. Why am I spending so much time mm -hmm. on that? And it's something I'd never really done before, but it's helped me a lot to sort of look at things from a different viewpoint and with less emotion and more, mm. um, you know, more facts. Yeah, it's practical. Yeah, exactly. Because I think sometimes it's easy to get caught up in the creativity and the sparkles and the next shiny thing. Um, and yeah, but I also feel I'm a bit like you, Elfie, that I, I love the thrill of the adventure of the unknown and, and just learning and being on a journey. And I think that's, it's always been more alluring to me than than knowing everything the same day, the status quo. Mm. I've just had um, a, a useful chat with someone who's become a bit of a mentor with me and they looked at me with excitement when I told them what I was doing. And then when I told them I wasn't quite sure how I was going to do it, they looked worried. And then they said, can we sit down with you and go through everything? And just and exactly what you just said, get the pyramid right find out what's really important, put them at the top and work out how do we achieve them in the right amount of days so we can make them happen and get rid of the chaos. And it was the best conversation I've had in a long time. I was buzzing. It's amazing how those little things that might seem little, when you have the right support systems in place, they can make such a huge difference to, again, your productivity, but your mental health and your ability to feel calm and in the best place to do your work. And um, I uh, resonate with that a lot. And I think it's a, a real journey to um, to actually 
have the courage to ask people for help. That's yeah. quite a thing in itself. So yeah, I mean, for instance, you know, I know you're going to be doing a lot of public speaking coaching, which mm -hmm. is awesome. That's so good. And um, one of the things I would say about that is, you know, you see a lot of the times, um, I used to, uh, I was looking recently at which products of that I do or sell make the most money and which mm. ones do I want to ditch? Because I was feeling so busy and like thinking, gosh, what am I spending my time on? And one of the things I was thinking that was my best seller was actually public speaking. Mm. And when I sat down and looked at it, because, and I won't have the same network or profile that you have, but when you go to an event, it's not just arriving and doing the talk for an hour and getting paid for that time. It's your prep time. It's yep. your taxis if you get them or petrol. Um, but on top of that, I've started to notice I have to put in an hour before and after just to talk to people. Oh, the energy, <laughs> because, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I have to be quite careful. I, I try to arrive and go and hide somewhere quiet mm. because I need to keep my energy really high before speaking. Yeah. And then afterwards, I don't mind, but it's it's protecting that, that space, that bubble before you go on stage that I think can be quite important. Mm. You know, with all of your stage experience, being on Britain's Got Talent and, you know, thinking digital TEDx, Newcastle, all these different mm. things. Do you have any kind of stage tips or um, what's the word, presenting hacks that you want to yeah. share? I, th I think number one would be find your voice and take your time finding your voice. And I, I say this, in all of the different disciplines that I've been involved with, whether it was stand-up or radio, um, it, it took me a while to find what I wanted to do. When I started out as a stand-up comedian, the very first five-minute act or ten-minute act I did was one-liners. So I just went on stage and just did lots of silly, ridiculous one-liners that didn't make any sense. They weren't connected. I had a stupid outfit on. Um, I, had a, I had a crushed velvet jacket uh, a Hawaiian shirt and a flat cap. And my first line was, now this is going to sound ridiculous. <laughs> One after another, silly jokes. And then after a short while, I thought, that's not going to get me very far. I'm quite good at chatting. How could you do that if you're on a chat show like this? It just wouldn't work. Just It wouldn't sustain itself over 40 minutes or an hour. So within a, pro a pretty short amount of time, I then became a compare and found that, oh, hang on, I'm, I'm quite good at chatting to the audience. I'm a bit better at being me. Oh, I can do impressions. I can throw them in. But all that took time. And that's the same with public speaking. That I think that's the same with um, TEDx. It's the same with, I think, any kind of presentation. It takes a while to find out what you're best at and what you can do. Now, there are people who will say, you must do it like this, or you, you, the only way to do it is like this. And I, I think I disagree with that. I think, you know, if you look at comedy, how many different ways are there of doing comedy? There's one-liners. There's people who tell stories. There's people who are surreal. There's, there's lots of different ways to be funny. And there's lots of different ways to give a talk. There's, there's serious, there's slides, there's without slides, there's with props, there's with silences. So I think it's, enjoy and explore the varieties um, because that's what I've done all my career, really. Um, again, when I start on the radio, I, oh, I was terrible. I was unbelievably bad. The first time, I think it would be about the first, the first afternoon show I did at BBC Newcastle. I remember I got a, a text and it's funny, you get lots of nice texts, but the one that you remember is the horrible one. And this person texted me and said, mate, you're terrible. I'll give you six weeks. And it was just, it was that short, uh, nothing more. And that stayed with me. And about 10 years later, that person texted me back and said, you won't remember this. Of course I did. Uh, and they said, I said you were terrible and I really feel bad about that. And um, I, I'm a fan and I listen all the time and I just want you to know. Um, but that person was right. I was terrible um, when I started out. I remember my boss saying to me, he said, um, you've got to be better. The stabilizers are off now. He said, it's just tight. He said, I don't know exactly how, but I know you can do it. And that was enough to give me belief. And that made me be a little bit better. And, and I always over-prepared and I always got in extra early. 
I used to get in before the guy who was on the show before me. And he'd been in radio for 20 years and he used to say, what are you doing here now? And I said, I've got to learn. You've got 20 years on me. I, it doesn't do any harm if I come in three hours early and every link mattered. Um, and it did, it, it improved and it was, it was nearly always hard work, repetition, putting the time in. That's how you find your voice. That's how you find your style. That's how you, even in a football team or a, any sport, you find your discipline by exploring and trying different events and different disciplines. And then you'll think, actually, I'm gravitating this way. I'm naturally a midfielder. I'm naturally a wacky comedian. I'm naturally a, a softly spoken public speaker. Mm -hmm. I think there are no steadfast rules about what you must do. But I do think if you take your time finding what you become, it's the most natural thing to do. I think that's beautiful because it resonates with something that I think a lot, which is, you know, I sometimes say your weird is your wonderful. Um, and that's one of my, my talks. If I do public speaking, it's why your weird is your wonderful yeah. and kind of what is your story? Because we all have a unique journey that we've been through. And like you say, some people will be really funny, really mm. wacky. Um, some people will be quite soft-spoken. Mm. You know, I can be quite soft-spoken and shy, but I still love to talk to people. Um, but it's, I think it's that journey about connecting with the audience mm. and, and really speaking to them wherever they are with whatever day they've had and just giving them an escape for half an yeah. hour or whatever it might be. However, at the same time, I think it also takes a lot of car courage to be who you really are. Yes. And I think that is what separates good speakers from, from average ones. Because if you go onto a stage and try to be somebody that you're not, and you know, I know we, we both know Simon Raybould, who's great, and he yeah. talks about the Batman, about stepping in to the, the uniform. And, and sometimes you have to put a persona forward. But I think it's also about being who you are on that day, where, where you are. Well, no one can replicate that, can yeah. they? Yeah. And, and I think story, the power of your story is untouchable mm -hmm. because it's your story. No one else can do that. No one else can tell it. And I've heard lots of uh, after dinner speakers and, and all comedians doing other people's jokes, but you can't beat doing your own and you can't beat telling your own story. So I could go on stage, uh, TEDx and say, you know, Gandhi once said something profound and this is what um, Winston Churchill said. Um, but if I tell a story that comes from my life or just comes from my day, just what happened in Tesco, it's my story. You won't forget it because it's your story. That's the first thing. And the other thing is it's yours. It's authentic. It's you. And I think it just comes from you and it's just less, I don't know, lazy. I think anyone can look in a book and, and find, you know, magical words from someone else. But if you can dig into your own day or life or past, it, it is an awkward thing. I think in this country as well, we don't like sometimes talking about me or, or showing you medals. Um, I've got a great story. And I love a story. This, I'm, this, I'm well, getting settled this, in. <laughs> sit back, throw another log on the fire. <laughs> This is a true story. When I was trained to be a priest, there was an old gregarious Irish priest who taught us communication. And this is another thing I forgot when I was setting myself up as a communication coach. I forgot that we were taught years before I became a comedian to do sermons and we did communication studies with videos and reviewed our preaching abilities and how to tell stories. So... This, this Irish priest, Father Marnie, was in charge of that course. So I liked that course. And, and I liked him. And we got on great. And he loved rugby. And he said, uh, I got a couple of tickets for the rugby lads. Do you want to come to Scotland? I'll drive us. So he takes me and another student up to Scotland for it was Scotland, France. Big international, five lit nations as it was then, rugby match. And we go, and the atmosphere is incredible in this cauldron at Merrifield. And we go into the reception at, at half time in the, in the box where they've got sandwiches and drinks and everything. And everybody knows Marnie, 
but in this quite special way. Whoa, there's Marnie in the coming round chatting to him. And I says to this person, I'm having a drink. I said, everybody knows Marnie. You, well, you played for Ireland. And I went, what? My lecturer, my the priest at my college, he played for Ireland. When? He went, oh, he was a great player. Gave it all up to be a priest. And I went, I know he knew that. So we're on the car going back to, to Durham. And I said, Marnie, you play for Ireland? Ah, oh, yeah, I don't, I didn't want to talk about it at all. So when we get back, I went to his room for a coffee. And I said, uh, tell us about playing for Ireland. Oh, no, no. I said, you must have photographs. He said, I've only got two photographs and I've never put them. I said, where are they? He said, they're back of a cupboard over there. I said, where? And it was a stock cupboard. So I went in this cupboard, went right to the back, and I found these two old, covered in dust, black and white photographs. And one of them shows this player throwing the ball. And Marnie's about to catch it like that. And you can just see tens of thousands of people behind him. And he's going to catch that ball and put it over the line for a try. And I went, why is that picture not on the wall? And he said, oh, no, no, that, that would have sent out the wrong message. All that. I said, no, it wouldn't. I said, we would love to talk. We, we th That's brilliant. That's part of your, your past. That's part of your story. That is, that, you don't, don't be embarrassed about that. One, one of the gospel messages is don't hide your talents under, under a bushel. So you, you've got to preach that from time to time. Um, you know, nah, nah. Anyway, the next time he did mass, we're all in this big chapel. Um, he got the photographs out and he did a sermon about it. And the next time I went to his room, it was on his wall. And it was, I didn't have to say anything. But it was the right thing to do, you know, it shows your medals, you know. what? Imagine being deprived of that story. If I'd gone through college not knowing that, what a loss, what a shame. And and I suppose the, the moral of the story is he was sitting on a story there. That was incredible. Uh, but I think everyone has a story like that, even if it's about a bus ride or a dog walk, or if you think hard enough, your life's full of stories. You're doing things every day. It's so true. So um, I I love to use LinkedIn. It's one of my favorite platforms. I do, yeah. And I see people posting all the time and often the ones that are getting the most interest or engagement are the stories. And I've seen a lot of stuff recently where people have said, but I'm just talking about this boring thing. I can't believe it resonates with so many people. Mm. But what is boring to us might be so different as somebody else, or it could be somebody else's dream to have a life like that, or it could be that um, people, I sometimes get, how, do, like, you've got such a busy week and I'm thinking, but yeah. I haven't even put a quarter of, yeah. you know, of what, what, what I'm doing. So it's so interesting because we all have different viewpoints and we're coming at things from different angles. Yeah. So stories I think are so powerful because they bring us together and they help us to see a different perspective and view of the world. And you never know which bit of the story is going to make a difference. And you never know which bit of a story is going to chime. I was, and this wasn't even a story. This was a bit of fun we were having on the radio with the breakfast team a few weeks ago. And I had some orange trainers. And the team were having a joke about me wearing orange trainers. And we did, I just can't remember. It hadn't been planned, came out of nothing, mentioned it, and that was it. I'm at Durham Big Meeting a couple of weeks later, which is 200,000 people marching through the street, pit banners and coal mine heritage being celebrated, brass bands, 200,000 people in the tiny city of Durham make their way down to the big field, the race course ground. And I was sat on the grass with my kids, not making a big song and dance or anything, just next to this little fence. We were almost hidden. And this older lady came up to me and said, is it, um, she said, I'm going to sound awfully daft now if you're not who I think you are. But are you Alfie Joy? And I said, I am. She said, I'm sorry. She said, I'll listen every day, but I had no idea what you looked like. And she hadn't heard my voice. She'd just sit and I said, well, how did you know it was me? She said, the orange trainers. <laughs> There's 200,000 people in the field. There were lots of people. Where, there wasn't just me wearing orange trainers. But that story just struck a chord. And it you, sometimes you, you'll, uh, the same thing will have happened to you. You'll have told a story and you think, that wasn't the bit. 
that wasn't the bit that I was trying, I was trying to make that point, but that was the bit that somebody found useful or helpful or brought up a memory. It's the power of story. It is. It's so powerful. Speaking of stories and the lovely, um, you know, experience you talked about with the heritage celebrations mm. in Durham recently. Can you share a little bit with us about your own story as a family, you yeah. know, being of pit mining stock? Yes, it's it's. Have you seen the film Billy Elliot? It's I think a lot of people know the story about the the ballet dancer kid and his dads in the uh, coal field and in the coal strike. And that's there's a lot of similarities. When I saw that, I just I cried my eyes out because there were so many similarities because when Billy Elliot wanted to go away to do ballet, it was uncomfortable initially for his dad because that's not what you did in a pit village. And in a similar way, I wanted to be a priest. I wanted to, I trained to be a priest when I was very young. And my dad couldn't talk about that. He struggled with that. Um, never, never stopped me doing that. Um, all he said to me about it was, and he cried his eyes out the night before I went away. He said, if ever you want to come home, come home. Don't really have to do this. And uh, But I really wanted to. And but I knew that gave me a superpower when I, when I went away. There's lots of other kids homesick and wanted to come home. I thought, well, my dad said I can come home anytime I want, so I didn't have any pressure to stay. And and I carried on doing it. Now, my only, I suppose, sadness is my dad. Even though he's a coal man, he's a very good singer. He used to get up and do a turn in the club. Um, he loved show business, and he never saw me do show business. So I think he would have. He would have almost enjoyed this more than that. But I think he knew I was always capable of doing this because I used to do this all the time. I used to do this when I was a little child. I'd get up and sing a song and do impressions from a very young age. But I just never thought it was conceivable to do it for a job because you didn't when, when you came from a, a working class pit village where I was from. It just wasn't the sort of thing you, you aimed for. It was more plausible to train to be a priest. That's how what it was. So off I went and I did that for 15 years. And then it wasn't until I was about 30 that I, I decided to leave. And suddenly I had a couple of epiphanies and my real vocation, ironically, I thought was entertainment show business presenting. It's so interesting to me because I've had such a similar journey yeah. to you. So as a kid, I was always um, in detention for chatting <laughs> and I was trying to sell pictures to all the neighbours. No. And um, I lived in South Africa yeah. and I would go around all of the neighbours and I'd ask for a rand or two rand or and I'd always buy sweets with the money. But I actually got told by my parents to stop selling <laughs> pictures because I was rinsing people I mean I was doing it every day <laughs> and I would charge people to listen to me read and I would choreograph shows and dances and get my sister how, teach her how to do yeah. things and um, however I think when I reflected on some things recently I developed this idea that people won't pay for your time or your skills or your mm. creativity because it, you're too much you know because that was kind of a memory as a kid that I'd I'd suppressed all this stuff and then when I was in my 30s, I loved the work I was doing, um, but I just felt like something was missing. And I completely, when I started podcasting, it was a complete like fluke. It was never on purpose, but I just loved it. And yeah. and now I'm, I'm thinking, gosh, I get paid to chat. What better world <laughs> is there than to get yeah. paid to chat and talk to people about their stories? It's amazing. Mm. And to share stories on stage. So I wonder if you've ever reflected on this, but... I sometimes think when you see what kids are really into when they're little, mm. sometimes that is almost a prophetic thing for them later. Have yeah. you ever thought about that? Oh, all, all the time. I, I think about, you know, my own kids and I, I, I beg them, find something you like and try and do it as your job and then you'll never work again. I know, I know it's an old cliche, but it could nothing could be truer. It's you saying, you have stumbled on podcasts. I can't. I get to do this. That's what it feels like every day for, for me, being on the radio or drawing pictures or life is just a complete joy. And you're just going to have so many, you know, better days. And and the, and I don't know when, when that switch happens, when the joy of being a child and the joy of, you know, drawing a picture at school and that freedom to express yourself and be in a play 
when when that stops for so many people and they think, well, I can't really do that for a job. That's that's no, that's not right. I'll just I'll I'll go and sit behind a desk and do something I'm not really keen on. But it happens to the majority of people. It's that word just, I think. Mm. So Anne English is a great friend of mine and she always says about the word just is is a is a place where dreams go to die. <laughs> you know, we, we always say, Oh, it's just this thing. And actually it's our super skill. Yeah. That actually I've I've had that word used in uh, again, um, could you just do this? So I'll give you an example. Someone asked me to draw a picture. Uh, and could you just draw us a picture? Uh, as if it's not draw me a picture. If you just draw me a picture, it means could you just knock something up for cheap? Um, could you could you just say a few words? Could you just it, it does diminish everything. Mm. Oh, that's, that's I'm trying to take it out of my vocabulary yeah. altogether, to be honest. But speaking of, you are a creative. You have a great social network and, um, you know, you do all kinds of different projects. Can we talk about boundaries for a moment? Mm. So what you've said there about just, you know, if someone asks you to just do a picture, you're actually an artist and you get mm. commissioned and yeah. paid to, to produce things. So what... Would you have any tips for anyone listening about valuing themselves and their creativity? Yeah. Don't be like me <laughs> because I'm the worst example. And especially uh, during COVID, I felt so guilty about having a job on the radio. And we, we were classed as key workers. I worked harder on the radio than I'd ever worked because they changed the whole structure of local radio during COVID. And they asked us to come in an hour earlier and to do the show on our own in a studio with a producer through a window there and the newsreader through a window there. And we weren't together anymore. And I used to have a co-presenter and she went off to do the afternoon show all for COVID. Absolutely, 100%. Um, and we felt like we were in the trenches. You know, we were helping people because we were getting lots of people saying, can you tell people about our food bank? Can you tell people about our community centre? Can you tell people about our care home? And it, and it was exhilarating because you, everyone knew there was such chaos going on all over the world. You felt you had a meaning and, and a cause, whereas I knew lots of people from my other lives, comedy, comedians, nothing. A couple of gigs on Zoom and that was it. So I felt... Terrible for them. Um, anyone who was asking me to draw a picture, I was doing them for free. Um, and even companies were, were saying, could you draw something for people who've helped our key workers or something? I was, yeah, yeah, and we'll give you the, oh, no, 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 I can't charge you during this. And and I, I pretty much, I didn't make a thing of it because I thought it will be out of control, but it, it was... It was wrong, really, because it, it devalued what I was doing. And a lot of these companies that were asking me to do that weren't. You know, they, they were offering to pay. They weren't saying do it for free, but I just kept insisting. Um, but, you know, there, there were businesses that prospered during during COVID. It became a, a secret and people didn't want to rightly make a song and dance about it. But I did speak to some people who go, I've actually done better, I, almost accidentally. I found something, but... Yeah, so I would say absolutely know your worth. Absolutely find the, the right price for what you do because you're worth it and you, you, you spent your apprenticeship getting to that stage. And, and also, uh, and, and this was probably for speaking gigs and for hosting gigs, I was very nervous again because I was on the radio and I felt guilty about, especially if it was for a charity or for charging anything at first. I used to do a lot of stuff for free and then someone said to me, you know, you're undercutting other acts, you're undercutting other performers, other event hosts, and also you're undercutting your family because you're giving that time to someone else and that time could be spent with your family. So when, they, when it was put like that, I thought, yeah. And also... I, I did a big, big uh, event for a charity that I really like and I have no problem doing doing work for. But I put so much into it that a, a good friend of mine said, can I ask you what you got paid? And I said, well, nothing. It's for, it's for a charity. And he said, well, the the person who did the lights got paid. The person who did the charity got paid. The person who turned up to do the raffle got paid. 
the, and now go, it didn't. He went, no, he did. And he should have. And they're all worth it because they're all professionals. He's in your profession. And, you know, the people who delivered the food got paid. The Hilton got paid. Um, and I, I still squirmed, but it did make me open my eyes and think, right, this, I've, I've got to look at this another way now. It's a really, really important theme that I'm so interested in. I've been doing a lot of research into mm. this because I've always been a giver. And there's a professor I really like at Newcastle University Business School. So I did my master's in business administration there. Yeah. Um, and he talks about hope culture and hope labor. And it's this idea which neither of us will need to do right now because we already have established networks mm. and exposure. But there there are lots of people who will do things with the hope that it might lead to something else yeah. or with the intention that it might attract exposure or attention. Or So um, there's there's a lot of work to, to stop that and to have people valued for their time and expertise. And I know I've thought about this a lot because I'm a member of the Artist Network, mm -hmm. um, which is a great uh, membership body for, for artists Worth and creatives. Hundred yeah. percent, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, um, I need bigger insurance now for the, for the space that yep. we're in. But um, you know, you can get joint um, insurance for public liability mm. and all that kind of stuff for a really reasonable rate. So I absolutely love them, but they have a real push on not charging. Mm -hmm. So I've had, uh, when I've looked for speakers in the past and it needed to be a free speaker, um, they would actually say, well, in line with the Artist Council um, and the Artist Network, we we actually can't do this for free. We need to push back on, yeah. you know, speakers need yeah. to be paid. And I thought that was such an interesting mm. shift the same time having worked in universities and alumni engagement and things like that there are always amazing people who've developed real skills who want to give back in that way yeah. without a fee so i think it's quite an interesting um theme to look at and it's something i'm really curious about at the moment as mm. i start to look at what i charge and i think what you said there about when you don't charge much or anything you're underselling yeah. other or undercutting other people but the other thing that really um, stood out to me is something I heard recently, which is around, you know, if you don't charge, you can't grow your platform, which means you can't do your purpose work yeah. and you can't yeah. have the impact that you want to make. So if you have a mission, how can you achieve it if you don't have the oxygen or the resources to get there? Yeah. And so that really helped me to understand, actually, we all need fuel, you know, yeah. whether it's food or gas at the yeah. moment, we're all worried about fuel. Um, but we all need things, the, the right ingredients to help us um, achieve our goals. So I think uh, one of the things that we can do as creatives is collaborate. It's something we do a lot here at Flamingo Heights where we might swap skills or um, swap a stage for a la lights or, you know, I think mm. that collaboration is really key in the creative industries. And um, I think it's going to be more key than ever as, as people start to worry about their livelihoods and things like that. Um, how does it feel leaving the BBC after such a long time and such an institution and actually mm. going out on your own? Well, it feels right, if I'm honest. I've absolutely loved it. Um, I'll, I'll really miss the rhythm of it. I'll miss the fun of it. I'll miss the opportunity. I'll miss my colleagues. And I'll miss most of all the listeners because that's your friend. That's the person you speak to. You only speak to one person on the radio. And, and you know, I, I got a letter from Val in Blythe um, and I'm going to read it out on my last day and not because I want everybody to know what she said to me. It, she has detailed all of the highlights it's almost a chronology of everything that I've done on the radio and lots of the things I'd forgotten about. And she just remembered so much. And I'm going to read it out because it's, it's a lesson, I think, to our managers and it's a lesson to all the other presenters to remember the difference we make when we, when we turn the mics on. It's not, it's not about me. It's about the difference we can make to them and you... It's the character and the company that you provide. And my mum doesn't have a telly. 
So my mum just has the radio and she never turns it over. She just has us on. Uh, that's all she listens to. Um, n not because of me, but she's always just been a radio person. And that's how powerful radio is for a lot of people, especially older people, lonely people. And and when you speak to just one person, a lot of people listen and think you're just speaking to them. And so it's a very powerful thing. And I've been lucky and privileged to do it. So I will miss that intimacy and that privilege of, of chatting to people in their kitchens or in their cars. And you, you, I get a lot of messages from people who almost speak to me as, I've, as if I've just been speaking to them. Wow. It's so personal. That is so beautiful yeah. to leave such a legacy like mm. that and to have people who've connected with you so yeah. much that they remember all of that. Mm. And I hope that you treasure that letter from Val. Hi, oh. Val, if you listen. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. That, I mean, that is really, really something. Well, um, if there, is there anything else you'd like to say to any listeners who maybe have followed your radio journey, but um, just in, in terms of if your highlight on the show? Well, um, hopefully one day I'll do a podcast. <laughs> Come and listen to me there. It won't be anything as glitzy or as fantastic as this one, but I'll learn a lot. Um, and then, yeah, follow me on all the different social medias. We and talk that in I'll still be there. I'm not retiring. I've got too much to do and too many things I want to do. And whether it's following my public speaking career or my children's artworks and children's books, you know, I'm out there doing different things. And of course, pantomime. I'm really excited about that. I can't wait to see you play all those um, yeah. merry men. <laughs> so uh, I have one last question for you, mm. Elfie. So what is your one word to nurture your zest? Well, I love this um, question when you ask this. And I thought about it. And I don't know if anyone's said this, but I love the word zest. Oh, that's Has my anyone... word. I know it is. It's it... my word from it... episode eight it's <laughs> in a... the first season. It's a great word. Yeah. And it's, it's a punchy word. It's a It's a... A great word in literature. It's a great word in advertising. It's been used in soap adverts, and it's a citrus word. I just love the the fizziness of it, and I I hope I'm a zestful person till I die. So I love I that. Say zest. I certainly am feeling that energy from you, and for me, it's 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 got a real zinginess to yeah, it, and yeah. um, it's an energy thing, mm. and I. I love that word. So you match with me. I've never had that before, Get in. but that's awesome. Well, I'll have to go you. back and re-listen to that episode. <laughs> <of Mr. Nick. laughs> thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for asking me. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you. You've been listening to Nurture Your Zest, and I've been your host, Ashley King. You can find us online on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Nurture Your Zest, as well as our website and YouTube channel. If you've liked our episode today, please give us a follow or leave a review or any comments. We love reading these. We look forward to catching up with you again soon as you learn to nurture your zest.